morning everyone how are you okay uh, many people practice a sitting meditation or walk on a spiritual path uh, to stay focused uh, in their daily lives or to maintain peaceful and the state of mind in their daily activities and so on. Let's think about today one of the paths to stay focused and tranquil in our daily life or how to deepen our sitting meditation practice. Why do you think uh, we have so many wandering thoughts when we are practicing sitting meditation? Because yeah. there's so much going on. <laughs> yeah, but some people still remain very calm. <laughs> Isn't it just the nature of the mind to always set thoughts? Yeah. So, let's say in this way. Yeah, thinking has become our habit. Eh? Because we have so many desires. Children don't have so many drifting thoughts. But why we have so many desires before that? Let's think about the Shakamani Buddha's case. You know, he was born as a prince in a small kingdom in India. In order to search for eternal life, he left the palace at the age of 29. At first, he searched a lot of spiritual teacher. When he learned their way of spiritual practice, within a very short period of time, he could easily reach to the depth or the level of his teachers. From the beginning, Buddha could be very deeply absorbed in sitting meditation. Why? Related with my today's topic, I would say, when he left the palace, he already let go of all the worldly things. He did not have an awesome desire for material things, fame, or in his mind, every reason. He already conquered that kind of things. In other words, he had a very good foundation of meditation or spiritual practice. That's why he could very deeply observe it in meditation and uh, reach uh, some level of uh, awakening very, very quickly. Mm. So they say, particularly considering the Shakyamuni Buddha's uh, case, uh, we usually say, great enlightenment uh, follows uh, great uh, renunciation. It does not, renunciation does not necessarily mean we just uh, throw well all the necessary things in our world. But he already renounced a lot of greed, desires, anger, delusion in his mind. He was ready to practice. Does that make sense? Yeah. His readiness is somewhat different uh, from the people uh, in this world. It's uh, from the Bible. Gospel of Matthew. Mm-hmm. Now someone came to him and said, Teacher, what good thing must I do to gain eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. But if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. Which ones? he asked. Jesus replied, Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother, and love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, 
I have wholeheartedly obeyed all these laws. What do I still lack? Jesus said to him, If you wish to be perfect, go sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. But when the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, because he was very rich. Then Jesus said to his disciples, I tell you the truth, it will be hard for a rich man or person to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I say it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter into the kingdom of God. The Bible says you cannot serve God and the money at the same time. But you don't have to worry about that. Many prophets in the Old Testament were millionaires. It's an attachment to the material we can utilize. That. Anyway, the reason why many Zen priests could easily observe the meditation is they already let go of a lot of worldly things. They do not have to worry about about their career building, or they do not have to worry about how to make more money. They have no families. So, um, let you think about that. What is uh, the center of our concerns of our worries? What is the center, the root? Let you think about that. I lost my job. Mm -hmm. The feeling that I experience may be very different from I watch some television and somebody lost his job. Your child is sick. It's different from your friend's child is sick. Or your son got the admission from the Harvard. Your feeling might be different from somebody got the admission from a very distinguished university. Truthfully speaking, the center of all our problem is I, our ego. That is the root. Just like the earth that revives around the sun, all our life, all our problems, concerns, and security, fears, originate from our sense of self. The root is I, always. One of the best ways to dissolve our sense of self and to get the freedom of mind and to cut the root of our all our wandering thoughts, not just on your meditation cushions, but in your daily life, to lessen your concerns and so on. Is, uh, meditation is very much important, uh, but our selfless service uh, for others, compassionate action, is a great way to dissolve our sense of self and to reduce our drifting thoughts. This is very, very important. On, mm, we chant here after sitting meditation. On Tuesday night, uh, between two sessions of sitting meditation, we practice uh, walking meditation. It may be the same walking. We practice walking. You walk to here from the parking lot. We walk to our workplace. Or sometimes we walk to the movie theater. Or we walk someplace to help somebody, and so on. It is the same walking, but depending on our intention, depending on our goal, the same action, whether it's walking or whatever thing. For example, when you fly to Africa, we can fly to Africa for business. 
or for hunting elephants to take a task or to help African children the cause may be done even though it's the same flying to Africa even though it is the same walking to some place depending on our intention depending on our goal the same action affects our mind differently the different karma is created by that sometimes our ego can be dissolved or sometimes the same action can consolidate our ego even though for example making money why do we make money would you like to buy more bigger house or donate the money for some some needy children or some retreat center whatever cause it is the same even though it is the same action we can feel very very different sometimes we can enjoy that action or life or sometimes we hate that action so that intention is very very important so I would like to say again to break the wall of ego one of the most powerful way is to help others with a very compassionate mind you do not have to worry about having a big compassionate mind when you in the process of helping others the compassionate mind can be cultivated one several years before the passing of mother Teresa one western journalist uh, interviewed her at the time she was very very sick he asked her, uh, how could you be so courageous, passionate to help all those people? Huh? She really always have to overwork herself. She's a very, very smart person, you know that. And uh, her reply was uh, very surprising to me. It's just like some Zen master's word. <laughs> she replied, because I know they are Jesus in disguise. In Buddhism, we say everything, every person is the manifestation of a Buddha. She said, I know they are Jesus in disguise. When mother loves her child, sometimes she knows what's going on in the children's mind. Yeah? She knows whether she's sick or well, even though the children does not say that clearly. Because her mind becomes one with that child. So she naturally becomes very, very wise, at least to her children. Likewise, compassion and the wisdom cannot be separated. When we are compassionate, we become very very wise person we may not become a person of knowledge but at least a weak one very very wise person they say when a bird is flying to nirvana to the land of nirvana they, should have, they fly with the two wings one wing is what one is the wing of two wings in Buddhism. What does that mean? One is wisdom, another is compassion. Yeah. It. What what is that scripture? I told you many times. Yeah, Diamond Sutra. In the chapter in the second chapter, Subhuti asked to Shakamuni Buddha, if a good man and good woman seeking the consummation of incomparable enlightenment, by what criteria should they avoid and how should they control their thoughts? 
His question was, he would like to attain great enlightenment and to get the liberation of a mind. But his mind, even though he's wearing the monk gloves, but his mind is constantly attached to a lot of wandering things, it's a lot of inner conflict and so on. So how could I control my mind? Then you can guess what the Shakyamuni Buddha's answer. It's a Chinese, so even though you read it, you cannot. Yeah, no. If you are in that spot, how would you reply to Sariputra's question? How can I control my mind? So, uh, by realizing that the that the ego is an illusion. Uh huh. Yeah, Buddha did not answer in that high level. <laughs> okay. Buddha replied, in order to conquer your mind, in order to discipline your thoughts, you should hold this kind of mind. And all living creatures of whatever class, born from eggs, from wombs, from moisture, or by transformation, All these beings are led by me to attain unbounded liberation nirvana. It's a literal translation. It means uh, in order to center your mind, uh, conquer your thoughts, you first uh, give rise to a aspiration, a vow, to save not all people, all sentient beings, including all animals. In in Keskill Mountains. Lead them to Nirvana. On this vow, on this anchor, by this aspiration, you can discipline your mind. Buddha said something very, very fundamental. When I first read this scripture, probably Buddha have replied, you should practice sitting meditation more. Buddha did not answer in that way. Do you know why all the Buddhists, most of them, meditation center, chant four great vow? Last year, sometimes we chant four great vow. Sentient beings are numberless, we vow to liberate them all. Delusions are inexhaustible, we vow to eliminate them all. Buddha's teachings are unlimited, we vow to master them all. The way of the Buddha is inconceivable. We vow to attain it. It's a too much idealistic or <laughs> holy, but or in our one tradition, why we chant the Ilwan Sang vow, vow to be united with the Ilwan Sang. We chant because we got the enlightenment for the benefit of all people. At first, we just conceptually chanted. But as time passed, it can be embedded in our mind. So it can guide our practice. It can guide our life. When I was a prime minister of one Buddhism in Korea, uh, I did not get along uh, one of my roommates. And uh, we had uh, some debate over something. And uh, at night, I was very upset and pretty angry. And that night, I happened to see some film that very uh, vividly describes uh, the situation of uh, African children. Most of them have some uh, HIV and so on. In order to get a bowl of water, they have to walk on several miles, that kind of a situation. The film contained that. When I watched that, all my resentment or concern completely disappeared. When thinking about those miseries, what I was worried about, we covered about was nothing. It's a really, really trivial thing. We, many people here as well as 
all the regular guys on the street, most of people, particularly in states, do not have to worry about what to wear, what to eat. But we still have so many worries huh? and the concerns. When we give rise a, a great vow, a great vow, it starts from, from a very conceptual level in the beginning. But we can be free from all those uh, trivial concerns and the worries. The scope of the freedom becomes uh, larger and larger. One of my teacher's uh, uh, sister experienced a very painful divorce uh, when she was uh, divorced uh, in her uh, mid-thirties. Uh, she was uh, so depressed, uh, she was uh, shut herself for a couple of years. Uh, nothing worked. But one day she decided her mind, uh, I could not live my life in this way. I cannot continue my way of living uh, in this fashion. And uh, even though she has uh, a lot of uh, issues and uh, she has a lot of uh, anxieties, uh, but she came to the nearby temple, big temple, and uh, start to help others, particularly the guys uh, who experience uh, that kind of uh, experience, but, but divorces and so on. After she started to help those people for several months, uh, she started to restore her fresh mind to regain herself. And uh, very fortunately, uh, the, after one year, she met a very wonderful man and they get married and they're still living in a very happy life. When we are down and discouraged, we do not have to focus on our own problem. If we can get our mind off ourselves and go meet somebody else's need, then our problem can be solved many times. My teacher, on the, he, he went to the, uh, Saudi Arabia, and uh, we know the Dead Sea, the, it's a, such a salty water. People are floating on their back, they can read a book. But it's a very interesting experience, but do you know why not many people enter that ocean, that water? Is there anybody who went to Dead Sea? Okay. Because the water is uh, so smelly, the stench, the smell is uh, terrible. Why? It's uh, stale and uh, stagnant water. There's incoming water, but there's no outgoing water. The, from the top of the, the surface of the water, it evaporates in that hot weather. So. It's the balance of the incoming water and the evaporation. My teacher told me it is just like the egoistic person's mind. There's a lot of incoming things, there is no outgoing. He's not happy. First of all, he is not happy. Egoistic person can really be happy. Then how can we help others? Physically, materially or mentally or emotionally. Physically, just as a dog or a lot of them, Karen, a lot of people here help us. I know one person who lives in Texas, I read that article. He lost the jobs and his life became very, very, first of all, very, very boring and he had a lot of time to kill. And uh, he's a very uh, sincere Christian. He went to the ASPCA, the Humane Society, and uh, started to help uh, groom 
the dogs so that they can look more attractive, so that people can be easily adopt those pets. After he volunteered in the Humane Society for one year, he became an expert in grooming. And even though he lost his job, he opened a pet grooming shop. The article said that he has more customers than he can handle. He hired a lot of employees. We can help others physically. Well, it's some other people. Or materially. In Buddhism or other tradition, we don't emphasize donation, but in the, I think it's in the Hebrew uh, scripture, they, many Christians uh, tithe their income, one tenth of income. The Bible says, uh, it is not yours but mine, it belongs to me. Yeah. By that, it is a very, very way to get a lot of a blessing by helping others to needy people that we can receive 10 times more, 30 times more, 100 times more. The Reverend uh, uh, Lee in, in Nuya One Temple's brother used to work in Africa. He's also a minister in Ka Kapunga. I heard this is some rural area in, in southern, in some very small country. He wrote an article after he came back to Korea. Their average life expectancy is 38 years. And more than 60% are AIDS patients. He said he wrote a lot of things. I heard exactly a quarter of people on earth have never used a telephone. Not the fancy telephone, they have never dialed a telephone. Most of the people on earth that live in that impoverished, miserable situation. Considering those situations, uh, we have so many unnecessary things. Uh, don't you think so? Think about that. How many things uh, we have in our garage or in our living room that we don't use? Uh, we can give that, those things uh, to, the needy, to the needy person. It's a very, very important way of practice. And also we can help others uh, mentally or spiritually. Like uh, saying some compassionate person to others or we can offer prayer for some, pe for some people around us. The best uh, way to help others uh, mentally is uh, to help them to walk on a spiritual path, to help them teach them meditation or some Buddha Dharma. If uh, it is, uh, you think, beyond the, your capacity, you can bring them here, or anyway, helping them meet the Buddha Dharma and the walk on the spiritual path. Just like the Diamond Sutra said, the merit open other people's uh, mind and heart is uh, more meritorious than your donating countless uh, treasures for others. It is uh, just like uh, buying a field and teaching how to cultivate the crops instead of uh, giving them several bags of uh, grains. We exactly, when we throw a ball, then it immediately bounces back. We exactly receive what we saw. The karmic One day, a followers of Sotesan, our founding master, was a little curious that his teacher was really, really enlightened. So he asked, God, when they were uh, by themselves, uh, teacher, are you really enlightened? 
Then Sotesan replied, he did not mention whether he was enlightened or not, but he said, I just uh, realized, I'm the person who realized uh, the karmic principle of a uh, cause and effect. And I'm just uh, trying to create uh, a lot of uh, blessings instead of uh, committing transgressions. He replied uh, in that way. So <clears throat> by helping others, uh, we can dissolve our karma dissolve our karma and also we can cultivate a compassionate mind and and a lot of anger resentment by helping others uh, actually it becomes a smaller and a smaller our mind becomes uh, purified and eventually all the things uh, in the universe will be on our side the universe will help us, protect us, guide us. And eventually, we can attain the great enlightenment. So there are many foundations of a spiritual practice of meditation. One of a very good path is selfless service for others. <clears throat>